They're, they're here local, Independence, Kentucky, right down the road. And I just wanted to say thank you all so much for coming out. And I will turn this over to uh, Miss Lisa for a powerful testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us. It's such an honor um, to be even invited. Um, we started our ministry a year ago, but we've been we've been following the Lord. I became an, uh, I became a Christian as an adult. So I had I realized my sin and got saved, radically changed. And this is my daughter Grace. I I named her Grace because I was saved by grace, and I had her right after. I then I had faith, and I had to finish the verse faith, so saved by grace through faith, that's their names. This is Jack, and this is Paul. Can you say hello? <laughs> These are my children. Um, so I just want to tell you a quick testimony about our lives. When um, Paul was born and he was a baby, he was so severe with autism. We thought he was deaf. We didn't think he was going to be able to speak. He, um, he was like such a terror to us and others and a danger to himself that like a car would be coming down the road and he the car would get right to us and we'd jump in front of the car. Like that's the kind of, it was just like so crazy what was happening. And we couldn't take him anywhere. I couldn't go to the grocery store. No one invited us to dinner. It was so bad. We didn't know what we were gonna do with him because we just, like our life completely revolved around keeping Paul happy and content and we didn't know was he going to go to school? Was he going to do, you know, what he was going to do or how he was going to be healed, all the things. So, um, I, I, uh, come on up here, Paul. I just want everybody to see you. So, um, I was in my driveway one day and, and I was just crying. I had my hands on the wheel and I was crying out to God. I had given my life to him and I was asking God, like, do I have to institutionalize him? Because I had already had the other three children. I didn't know if we were going to be able to make it um, as a family. It was so bad. And my sister moved to Australia at the same time. And she had all these keys, you know, that she was checking the doors and the locks of all the keys in the house. And they had had children, so the doors were turned around. And she was checking all the keys. Well, she got locked in a bedroom. And none of the keys worked. So she threw herself on the bed and started praying for us because she knew what state we were in. And she um, she was laying there praying about an hour. And the Lord said, get up and go try the door. And she wrestled with God. So I tried the door already. He said, get up and go try the door. So she goes to the door, takes a key. And right when she gets to the door, he says, there's a key to Paul's healing. And she stuck the key in the door and opened the door. So she had re really encountered God that day. It was so excited. Couldn't wait to tell me. She called me up, Lisa, Lisa, you know, like the Lord spoke to me. There's a key to Paul's healing. There's a key to Paul's healing. She tells me the story. And I said, well, what's the key? And she said, I don't know. You have to find out for yourself. <laughs> so I, I, you know, this was at the most desperate time. And so we, um, we started to take Paul wherever we were living in Maryland at the time. And we would fly to Florida. If we heard of a treatment, we'd fly to Florida and we'd get that treatment We'd spend all this money and come home, and he'd not be any better but worse. Then we'd go to Cleveland, do the same thing, come back. And so for a solid year, I was seeking healing for Paul in whatever place I could find. And then one day I said, Phil, I really feel led to go to this church across town. It was about 35 minutes away. And he said, okay, let's go. We walked in the door, and they were handing out literal keys to everybody in, that was coming in the door. And I was like, just couldn't even hardly stand myself. I'm like, the Lord is going to speak to us today. He's going to tell me the key to Paul's healing. And I was sitting on the edge of my seat. And now I had only been a Christian two years. So I knew some of the Bible, but I didn't know all of it very well. And he started to tell the story about the woman with the issue of blood. Well, I knew that she had reached for the hem of his garment. <laughs> I knew that she had reached for the hem of his garment and that she was healed immediately, you know. And so I knew the power of God left him and healed her. But I didn't know that she had searched and gone from physician to physician to physician to no avail to actually spend, I literally just read it again. It said spent more than she had, and which is what we did. And, um, and just became worse. And I began to cry and cry in my seat because it was a cry of repentance. I was so broken and sad that I, I, I knew what God was saying. I've been seeking everything but him. 
But as we continue to listen and he continued to preach, at the end of it, he said, everybody hold up your key. And he said, there's a key to your healing, and it's Jesus. And from that day forward, we came home, and Phil and I, you know, it's not that we don't take care of him. Of course we do. But we, we just said, God, we're going to seek you. We Forgive us for seeking everything else but you for healing. And we began to go to prayer meeting after prayer meeting. And honestly, right over here, there was a 92-year-old lady that had a prayer meeting, and she anointed him with oil, and he walked out changed. Hallelujah. We, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, to God be the glory. And we truly did seek the Lord. We're still waiting. We're still waiting. We, there's still, but now Paul, they said Paul would never speak. Hi. <laughs> Um, they said Paul would never be able to read, and he reads books this thick. So, and, and one of the things that I would just touch Paul like this, and he would go, you know, he didn't want to be touched. And now, and I'm just like, God, I just want a hug for my son. And now he hugs me every day. And it's just such a precious, wonderful thing. I can't even tell you. It's God be the glory. So the Lord, this drama, these are my kids. And the Lord dropped, this is a prophetic drama. He dropped this in my spirit, and he showed me all the moves he showed me and i said the lord showed me this would you guys be willing to do it girls are like yeah the guys are like <laughs> but they're doing it <laughs> um but i'm just like it's not just for spectating it's for participation will you please worship the king of kings and the lords and lord of lords with us today
so much. Yeah. Yeah. Foyer Family Ministries, everyone. There's a pamphlet on the back if you want more information about their ministry. Let's just give God honor and glory and praise for what he's doing in Paul's life, that ministry. God, we just praise you this morning, Lord. We declare, Lord, you are on the throne, Lord. We will praise you now, Lord. God, knowing, God, that, that this you own, God, the cattle on a thousand hills, Lord, and that you are, God, above all, and that you, God, are redeeming, God, each one, Lord, God, through Jesus Christ, Lord, for your, God, for your glory. God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We set it apart, Lord, for your purposes. God, and we thank you, Lord, for each one, God, who plays a part in any way. We thank you for it. God, may your spirit be here all the more. Give it all the glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Well, this morning we're going to hear from our brother Mike Manuel, who's been instrumental in us even be standing here today. He's preached in this church uh, heritage fellowship uh, many times before, and I want to thank Pastor uh, Clint Keep, who's not with us this week. He's with family out of town, who's just in a new uh, spot where a daughter is in a different church out of state. Uh, but he's been so gracious to us in, in offering uh, this beautiful facility. Uh, Paul, with the wonderful worship team and, and media, yeah. thank you so much, uh, Home Church, for having us. It is a blessing to open your doors. Um, and, and again, thank you very, very much. Well, Brother Mike Manuel, he's been all over the country and the world uh, preaching the gospel. And to this morning, we're going to have a time of apologetics. Hosea 4 6 talks about people being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And you can get it all kinds of different things. And, and we will keep it on track with it being gospel centered this morning. But just know that, you know, there's a reason that we have faith. And so I won't steal Brother Mike's fun, you'll fun thunder, but I ask that you would come. Begin to think about questions that you'd like to ask him, because there will be an interactive time of Q&A towards the end of this morning and uh, before we get into our business meeting and, and things of that nature. But thank you, Brother Mike Manuel. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Michael. That presentation was powerful. Amen. In John 3, 2, Nicodemus said, No man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. God is still working miracles. We need to reach people on the spiritual realm, the intellectual realm, and in the physical realm. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, the Jews seek for a sign, the Greeks searching after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those which are called Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The theme scripture, if you put the outline up, of Christian apologetics, daily is similarly this, 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Christ said in Matthew 22.37, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. When you become a Christian, you don't commit intellectual suicide. It's the wisest decision you'll ever make. Some people think Christianity is based on fable, folklore, legend, myth, or superstition. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible is factual in all the statements that it makes. It has been confirmed by archaeology, by history, and by human experience. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of Acts 10, 38. The Apostle Paul took the gospel to the ends of then the known world. Here was a man of antiquity that might have been the most intelligent man of his time. Now, some people say that Albert Einstein was the most intelligent man that ever lived. Actually, Albert Einstein said the worst mistake he ever made in his scientific career was believing in the steady state theory. In fact, Michael told me there was a question sent in, how old is the earth? The earth came into existence. The steady state theory stated that everything's always been here. Now, that idea has been totally discredited. Now, cosmologists, those are experts that theorize on the origin and nature of the universe, believe in the Big Bang Theory. The reason that the steady state theory has been discredited is because we know that the universe is radiating out in every direction. These people that call it the Big Bang say that a subatomic atom 
under intense heat and energy, exploded. Cosmic and kicked in, and everything came into existence. Now, if you can believe that, I've got property in southern West Virginia I'd like to sell you, and I promise you, it's not in Hill Country. Actually, now, believing in the Big Bang Theory, you're going to have to believe in God. Actually, one man back in 2014 said that it was a gigantic explosion. And when I was able to respond to his statement, I simply said, you can go home this afternoon, detonate dynamite in your living room, come back a half hour later, and see the improvements have been made. Explosions don't create things. They pulverize and destroy things. Now, if there was a big bang, it actually was a release of great energy. In Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Something had to cause the Big Bang because there's a scientific law of causation. Every cause has an effect. There's no effect without a cause. Every cause has an equal and opposite effect. What caused the Big Bang? Now, some have tried to theorize that there is infinite regression. This caused this, and this caused this, and this caused this, but logically you know that's not true because... There's no initiating point. There's no beginning. Now they have to believe there's something that is self-existent. An uncaused first cause. A prime mover. God told Moses to tell Pharaoh and the Israelites in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. Deuteronomy 39, 40, so I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. People say, where did God didn't come from anywhere? He always has been, He always will be. Because if something created something and something else created something, it is lunacy on the face of it. So now you have to believe there is something that's uncaused, that's self existent. Point number two, you'll have to believe whatever this uncaused first cause is. It's intelligent. Why? Because the universe has symmetry, sequence, design, and order. That doesn't come out of randomness and chaos. That comes out of arrangement, which speaks to purpose, which speaks to will, which speaks to intellect, and now the taboo word in some places, which speaks to God. Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, our theme of scripture, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, be ready to give an answer. That word in the Greek is apologia. When we talk about Christian apologetics, we're not talking about apologizing for something we did or said that was wrong. That word means to defend the faith. Jude 3 and 4 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to remind you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? For there are certain men who crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denied the O Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're told we need to defend the faith. Paul said in Acts 22, 1, and in Romans chapter 1, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. But in Acts 22, 1, 8, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Actually, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you don't have much of a reason to believe. Well, my daddy believed the Bible. So what? But his daddy believed the Bible. So what? You go to India. You might ask somebody, what do you believe? I believe in the Upanishads. Why? My daddy believed in the Upanishads. Why? Granddaddy believed in the Upanishads. There's a reason why we believe in the Bible. The Bible is a supernatural book that has supernatural information in it. The only God would know. Psalm 19.6 talks about the sun moving on its circuit. We didn't discover that until recent times. How could the psalmist David 3,000 years ago know that the sun was revolving? 
Now it takes the sun 200 million years to complete one revolution around the universe. And the sun is hurtling through space at 600,000 an hour. All the planets, moons, asteroids, meteors, comets, and space debris in our solar system are along for the ride through gravitational pulls. So, ministers, if you ever have somebody come and say, you know, Pastor, I just don't feel like I'm going anywhere, tell them you're in perpetual motion. In Job 27, God said he hung the empty space over the north and he hung the earth on nothing. Now, we didn't discover this until the middle of the 17th century A.D. The Eastern religion taught the earth was on the back of a camel walking around. And it's sad to say, my ancestors, the Greeks, taught that Atlas was holding the earth up and he tricked Hercules into taking the earth. And Hercules tricked Atlas into taking the earth back. But what did we discover in the middle of the 17th century A.D.? If you go 96 miles, of course, I didn't know the actual mileage, but if you go 96 miles above the earth's surface, above the exosphere and the ozone layer, you go into the vacuum of space, the earth is hanging on nothing. We need to be able to tell people why we believe in the Bible. The Bible has predictive prophecy in it. Now, thank God for meteorologists and weather people, but they're lucky if they get weather beyond 72 hours. Of course, now they're sure what the weather's going to be like a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now. But it's quite interesting back in the 1970s, some of you are old enough to remember the 1970s, the climatologists and meteorologists said we were going into an ice age on the front page of Newsweek magazine, The Coming Ice Age. Now we're burning the planet up. Do you know that one volcanic eruption, depending on the size of the volcano, emits enough CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, into the atmosphere more than one year of all human activity on this planet? God created the universe, He spoke it into existence sign and order all around us. Haley's Comet. Every 80-some years, you're going to see it. Order speaks to intelligence. If you find coded information, we are going to get into a lot of this, and we're going to have time for questions and answers. And if we don't have an answer, I'm not going to try to manufacture one. I'll just say I won't know. But maybe somebody else here might know. And if not, we'll see if we can find out. But the Bible has answers that we haven't even thought of. Now, point number two, the cosmological argument for God's existence. Now, that is existence itself. The universe is vast beyond imagination. In Jeremiah 33, 22, God told Jeremiah, count the grains of sand along the seashore, count the stars if you can. On a clear, moonlit night, you can see 1,100 stars in the sky. But that's not all the stars there are. I did a creation event in Oldie, Maryland back in September 2015 for Bishop Johnson, native Liberian, by the way, great man of God. He was stranded here in 1992 as a native Liberian. He couldn't get back home. God told him, don't become a refugee, become a missionary. He started preaching on the streets of Silver Spring, Maryland. Started a little church there. He heard me preach at a church in Washington, D.C. and asked me to come the next year. And they went from that little church. They bought a bank building, a second bank building. Now they bought a Christian school up in Oldie, Maryland. They used to be in Silver Spring, Maryland. But anyway, he wanted to come in for a creation weekend. And they tried to get somebody to debate we, from Howard University. But we thought we had somebody to debate. And then they decided not to. But we did another creation event. But I was teaching on that Friday night. Probably 700 people there. And four professors from the university were in the audience. All four Saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And one guy, I don't know if he was from Uganda or Tanzania, and he was a cosmologist. And I'm talking about the vastness of space. You know, in the Milky Way, that's the galaxy that our solar system is in. There are, this is with an M, like Mike, millions of solar systems. Millions. Could you imagine trying to count all the space debris? 
and everything in our solar system? And then I had mentioned and he, he, about the vastness of space because they really don't know how many galaxies there are. They thought maybe there are 200,000 or whatever. But then he, he said, look, Reverend, I want to augment what you just said. He said, now they're thinking they're over, get this if you're ready, over two trillion galaxies. Now think of it. Where would the end be? Would you be going through the universe? There's a sign. Then no more. Go back. Okay. Let's go back. When God said light be, from that very moment, the universe has been expanding. Seven times in the Bible, it says that the universe is expanding. Before we knew, the universe is expanding. Isaiah 40 and 22, and by the way, Isaiah 40 and 22, he sets upon the circle of the earth. That word in Hebrew is chowang, which means a sphere. The flat earth concept did come out of the church. The flat earth concept came out of secular philosophy. From St. Augustine to St. Thomas Aquinas, the church taught the earth was a sphere. It's only when the church left biblical revelation that it wound up with egg all over its face. Then after that, when he said he sits on the circle of the earth and inhabits like grasshoppers, he stretches out the heavens like a tabernacle for them to dwell in. Stretching out means it's expanding. We just discovered it. That's what discredited the steady state theory. Another reason the steady state theory has been discredited is because of the second law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy. In a closed system, which the universe is, when energy is used, it cannot be transferred back into energy that can be used. Actually, the universe is dying a slow heat loss death. Mentioned twice, I found in the Bible. Psalm 102, 25 through 27, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Of old, God made the earth and the heavens. They're going to wax old. He's going to fold them up like a garment, but his years will not fail. Do you think you begin to think all of this? that's mentioned in the Bible, that the universe, seven times, Psalm 104, two, seven times it talks about the universe expanding. The universe has mysteries that's revealed in the Bible. Job 34, 12 talks about, 38, 12, talks about the earth being like clay on a seal. That's a potter's well. You know what that's talking about? Rotation. Genesis 2 7 says, God formed man of the dust of the ground. There are 14 elements in the soil. Those same 14 elements constitute the human body. Don't want to jump ahead to the next thing, but anyway, evolution says that we go from the simple to the complex. Not, not, not. We go from the complex to the simple. When a sperm fertilizes an egg and a zygote is formed in the first instance of life, there's enough information to fill 1,000 sets of encyclopedias. That's why in Psalm 139, 14, he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knoweth right well. When you look at the rotation of the earth, do you know the moon re revolves around the earth? It takes it a month. It takes the earth a year, 365 one-fourth day, to revolve around the sun. And all these things are set in motion. And now two of our planets rotate in the other direction, Venus and Pluto. Poor little Pluto. They tried to say it wasn't a planet. Now I believe they're going to bring, bring Pluto back into the solar system. But I never did. <clears throat> Discount Pluto <clears throat> being a planet. That shows that there was order and design to the universe. Now, the Earth is a marvelous planet. Now back to the complex intricacy of human life. There is more complexity at the cellular, microcellular level than at the composite, macro level of the complete human body. Actually, the cells that make up our body which, of course, you've heard about the atoms, you can't see them in the eye. Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen 
We're not made of things which do appear. Blood is marvelous. Do you know for blood to clot, 12 chemical reactions have to occur simultaneously in the first generation. Or nothing would ever live. That's talking about immediacy, where evolution says things happen gradually, sequentially, over a long period of time. Well, what about evolution? What good's a mouth without an esophagus, without a stomach, and without a colon? If an organism was living without a mouth, why would a mouth form if there's no place to send the food? What purpose would there be in a mouth without an esophagus, a stomach, and a colon? Now, actually, a few, well, a few years ago, it's been over 20 years ago, I got cussed out by a microbiologist down at Moorhead State University. I was preaching at the church I just preached at last week. And this microbiologist uh, had about 20 or 30 young people there. And anyway, this young youth minister, we, we started talking. I started talking to the microbiologist, and I started talking to them about science. And I said, now, your theory is an amoeba, a single-cell life form, came about on its own. He said, well, you've got that right. I said, that's unscientific. And he bristled and said, what are you talking about? Spontaneous generation is a fallacy. Science is supposed to be based upon empirical data, verifiable proof. It's never been known or observed that life came from inanimate, non-living matter. Life begets life. So biogenesis is the truth. I said, now you believe through mitosis, this cell divided itself, and now you've got two undifferentiated cells. And you would say that one cell would become the male, the other cell become the female. It might take 200,000 years, 250,000 years. I said, how did that happen? Well, he became angry. He cussed. He said, blank you, preacher, go to hell. Got his vehicle, pit off the parking lot. Young lady there, I think she was a sophomore at Moorhead State. She said, that was amazing. She said, you're a preacher, and you gave the science, and he's a scientist. I said, man, before I became a Christian, I had to know the Bible was the Word of God. See, a lot of people that's going around and, and, and saying, you know, hey, I'm a Christian because uh, daddy or mommy's a Christian. That's what people are in our area. You need to know that the Bible is the Word of God, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he rose from the dead. When you know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, it will embolden your faith. Then she said, I am so sorry that he hurt your feelings. I said, what are you talking about? She said, he told you to go to hell. I said, that hurt my feelings. That made me feel good. What? She said, well, I'm sorry he embarrassed you. What do you mean he embarrassed me? Well, he told you to go to hell with all these young people around. I said, no, that made me feel good. She said, I don't understand. I said, young lady... He says he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God, heaven, or hell. He told me to go to hell, so I made some progress. We ought to have a good time witnessing for the Lord. But don't think everybody's going to be cordial and um, nice. Sometimes they're going to get angry. How many of those got angry at Jesus? They got angry at the Son of God. Hebrews 12, 3, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, Lest you be wearied and faint in your own minds. He said, you've not yet resisted the blood against sin. And Christ said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore death, the world hates you. So there's light and darkness. But listen, aren't you glad somebody brought you the gospel? Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? I'm glad somebody prayed for me. I'm glad somebody stood in the gap and made it the hedge on my behalf. But I had to know that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, the cosmological argument is existence itself. Either the universe has always existed, came to existence, and st as stated earlier, the steady state theory has been rejected by all cosmologists and um, astronomers. By the way, sidebar note, guess what profession has the highest believers now, I'm not talking about, of course, you know, the ministry you would hope. <laughs> Astronomers. 
Why? Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day in the day uttereth speech, night in the night shall acknowledge there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. You can look at the sky, you can look at the heavens, and you can know there's a creator. If you walk into an art gallery and you see a painting on the wall, is it a, a big jump to think, well, there must be a painter? If you go to New York City, look at the skyscrapers, is it a stretch to think that there was a construction company? Hebrews 3, 4. Every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. So when it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmness showeth his handiwork, people say, well, what about people that don't believe in God? Romans 1, 20 says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are cleanly, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power of God is, so that they are without excuse. And Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3. He said, now, the Jews received the scriptures. Did they benefit? He said, some. He said, but those then that didn't receive the law have the law of conscience, which is a law unto themselves. Romans 2.15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing their witness, and their thoughts to mean, while accusing or excusing one another, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Then in verse 29, he is a Jew which is one inwardly, not outwardly, circumcisions in the heart and the spirit, not of the flesh, who pray, who's praise not a man, but of God. People can know there's a God. And God will answer any honest heart cry to know him. Jeremiah 29, 13, you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with 22% of your heart. With 37% of your heart. No, with all of your heart. I'll tell you what, when we get serious about God, I got a phone call yesterday from a young lady. She was going to go into evangelism, and she just dedicated her life back to the Lord last year, and she, she's on fire for God. And she said, I, I really now, I know, she said, I went to church, and and I said I was a Christian, but I really didn't know Jesus. And uh, she got into some things, but now she's saved. And uh, we're going to help her into the evangelistic field. But she's on fire of God. And I told her, I said, you know what happened? You really met Jesus. When you really meet Jesus, you'll know it. I loved our name to Shambach, a great tent preacher. There was a man that came up to him after he preached under a tent one night. I said, Shambach said, yeah. Am I a Christian? No, you're not a Christian. Well, Shambach, you don't know me. He said, I don't have to know you. He said, when you get saved, you'll be the first one to know it. First John 5, 10, he that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are. Not going to be someday. We are children of God. Second Timothy 1, 12, Paul said, I know in whom I have believed. It's a no-so salvation, not a hope-so salvation. And we can know the truth, John 8, 32, and the truth shall make us free. Now down to the teleological argument, Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you for I have fearfully and wonderfully made that my soul knoweth right well. That's a design argument. If you see something that has design to it, don't you know there was a designer? It's like the evolution of the eyeball. Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species in 1860. He was flummoxed because they couldn't find any transitional intermediate connector fossils in the fossil record. And they haven't found them to this day. He said there should have been millions of transitional forms in the fossil record, and we have found none. It seems that evolutionists know everything about the missing link except that it's missing. No paleontologist, creationist, or evolutionist will deny the fact that there are missing links and gaps. There are no connector fossils connecting any species to another species. I can prove it to you. Look today. You don't see three-fourths of a man, one-fourth of an ape, three-fourths of an ape, one-fourth of a man. In fact, one fellow said, well, we're 98% connected to apes. I said, no big deal. We're 93% connected to earthworms. The commonality is in the material that God used to make us, not in the arrangement. Give me a one and six zeros. I can have one million or point six zeros and a one. There's a big difference between the former and the latter. There's such a 
difference between the intelligence of an ape, a chimpanzee, a, or a gorilla, and a man. You give an ape, a chimpanzee, a gorilla, a monkey, a computer and a typewriter, and let him work on it for eternity, he won't be able to type Shakespeare's Hamlet or Homer's Iliad or Odyssey. It's beyond his capability. You don't see these connections. Now, the so-called half-men, half-human skeletons they found have all been frauds. The Piltdown Man was supposed to have been 500,000 to a million years old. The Piltdown Man was a 600-year-old skull of a woman, a 500-year-old jaw and a orangutan, and the bones were doctored to give the appearance of age, and it was totally discredited. The Peking Man was reconstructed from a skull fragment, three molar teeth, and part of a thigh bone. And then the Nebraska Man was reconstituted from a tooth. But upon closer examination, it was discovered to be the tooth of a pig. Now you'll see in textbooks, they'll show this progression of man. No. What do we actually find? Apes and men. Man has a bloodstream. They found in the Cambrian period, they say 550 million years ago. Now the dating of that is very suspect because carbon-14 dating, dated snails' shells that were alive as being 27,000 years old. And they're making the assumption the rate of carbon loss of any substance will be the same under any circumstance. But catastrophic occurrences would have an effect upon the rate of carbon loss. Now, there's good news and bad news for you all here today. The good news is I've got a time limit. The bad news is my battery went out this morning. So, Brother Steve, keep me posted on what time is it now. I've got plenty of time. I'll just take the time. But when you look at the Cambrian period, complex life forms abruptly appeared in the fossil record with no precursor, predecessors, predecessors, forerunners, or antecedents. In other words, you look back before the first instance of life, there's nothing. Then you find well-developed life forms with backbones, heart, lung, kidneys. Richard Dawkins, a prominent evolutionary biologist that teaches at Oxford College in Cambridge, England. We find fully evolved life forms with no history. It's as though they were planted there. No, they were created. You know what he made this statement about science? Science is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. One of his colleagues said, we have to remind our students that though it seems as though things were made for a purpose that it all happened through naturalistic forces. So Arthur Keith wrote the 100th forward to Darwin's Origin of Species in 1960. And here's what he said. Evolution is unproved and unprovable. But we believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. Well, I have to agree with the man. If you won't go to where the science takes you, you're not a thinking person. He said it was unthinkable to believe an intelligent design which the fossil record indicates and shows. Life forms are revealed through the DNA, dexo-ribonucleic acid. That's a building block of every living thing. Actually, there was a man who tried to prove evolution. I felt sorry for the mice. And he started cutting off the tails of mice. And he was going to show, after so long of a period of time, the tails would get shorter and shorter and shorter. But the tails remained the same length. He got mad and killed all the mice. It wasn't the mice's fault. Why did he kill all the mice? He got mad because he didn't get the result he was looking for. We're only a product of our parents, their, their parents, all the way back to the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Now, 
these scientists and statements they've made. Richard Leakey was a prominent paleoanthropologist, and he came up with the punctuated equilibrium theory. Do you know why he did it? He said because of a lack of fossils. Here's what he hypothesized. Life forms continued in their present state for maybe millions of years, and in one generation, they changed it to another life form. I, I talked to one fellow. I said, that's wrong. And you know what's wrong. He said, well, no, he was a smart man. I said, no, he had to come up with a way to explain our existence without God. He couldn't find the connector fossils because here's the thing about it. I told him, if there is change at the DNA level, it won't manifest 10,000 generations later. It will manifest in the first generation. Richard Leakey, he said, this man was a noted evolution. He said, if pressed, we ought to put on a full court press. If pressed, I would have to say, there's more evidence for an abrupt arrival of man on the scene than there is a gradual evolving. And if further pressed, let's put on a full court press. I would have to say, there is no evidence of man being connected to any other species in the fossil record. They're asking us to believe what they cannot prove, which is unscientific. We ought to believe in what the universe actually says. And listen, it's important to do investigation on your own because a lot of people will say things that they can't substantiate. Human beings were made the image and likeness of God. Plants react to outside stimuli, but an oak tree doesn't know I'm an oak tree and over there is a cherry tree. No. But the bot botanists say that plants can react to outside stimuli. If it gets cold, if it gets hot, they react to it. But then you take dogs and cats, they are sentient beings. You know, they have self-consciousness. Usually dogs know their dogs. They run around with dogs and chase cats. Cats and cats know their cats and they run from dogs. Sometimes you'll see an exception to the rule. Sometimes cats and dogs, you know. Dogs will watch out for the cats, and, and the cats will purr and rub up against the dog. But a dog knows it's a dog, and a cat knows it's a cat. But you and I are made with a God consciousness on a higher plane. Christ said in John 4, 23, the Father was seeking for those to worship him in spirit and truth. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, the God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, pneuma, soul, suke, and body, soma, be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a God consciousness about us. People that say, God, aboriginal folk in remote areas of the earth, when they do something wrong, they know it on the inside. That's a law of conscience. They take something they shouldn't take. Or they hurt somebody that they shouldn't. Now, I'll tell you this, if somebody continues in that pattern, You'll develop a hardened heart. It's just like a cat. You know, if you're working and uh, blisters forming on your feet, it can be quite painful. But you keep working with that, and a callus will form. And callus says it's actually uh, dead cells. You could take a pin, stick it into the callus. Now, if you go deep enough, you'll know it. So you have the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is dead cells. The dermis is living cells. Well, how am I going to know the difference? You stick a pin. If you go under the epidermis too far, you'll know when you reach the dermis. Hallelujah. I'd argue. Darwin said that if small structures could not operate without all the necessary parts to the lowest level, it would destroy his theory. His theory has been destroyed. The bacteria flagella has a whip-like structure that acts like an outboard motor. It has a forward and backward gear can move at 1,000 RPMs. has a economy of precision and construction. Disable one component of flagellum, and it has no functionality or utility. That's why even Darwin said about eyesight. To even think that eyesight could occur with all of the details that would be necessary 
And when I went to college in the early 1970s in Marshall University, Huntington, West Virginia, they taught that fish without eyes were swimming out from under rocks, and the sunlight was hitting the front lobe of the fish's head, and these sensing membranes began to form. Now, how come it only formed on the front of the head? Why didn't some of these sensing membranes form on the back of the fish? And then they said from sensing membranes, all this came about for eyesight. Well, how, let me ask you this. It's a rationale. How would the sense of membrane know that this has to happen, this has to happen, and this has to happen? For eyesight to occur, you have to have the pupil, cornea, iris, and the complete eyeball intact. So all these things have to happen accidentally over and over again, which is one in millions and millions and millions. But here's the thing that after I got saved, I got to thinking, my goodness, if I'm sweet, and every time I swim out into the sunlight, I get a headache, guess where I'm staying away from? I'm not going out in the sunlight. <laughs> Any organ that forms in a body, now think of this, that's dependent upon another organ, how would the other organ know it has to develop in the next organ to the next organ? Do you see the insanity of it? That's why, let me tell you about evolutionists and naturalists, they'll use these ambiguous terms. Could have been, might have been, should have been, we think, we feel, and we suppose. That's real science, isn't it, preacher? No, it's guesswork. What we're talking about, intelligent design, is based upon factual information, not idle speculation. We as creations have, we embrace science, legitimate, bona fide science, which supports the Bible. The number one reason why young people turn away from God, according to the Pew Research poll, is when they go to college, they're taught evolution. Number two reason is they see a rank hypocrisy among church members. That's why it's important you and I walk out our faith. But the first thing, we and a lot of this we see going on in the country is because we drop the ball not teaching young people about the validity of the Bible. Just assume, well, this is a Bible belief. Come on. Why believe in the Bible? Why not believe in the incantations of a witch? Because the Bible is accurate in every statement that it makes. And it makes statements that only the God of the universe would know. Axelot's argument, moral argument, Romans 5, 12, Therefore, as by one man... Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all of sin. What time is it, Steve? That's right. I still got plenty of time. See, the Bible says the watch and pray. He's doing the watch, and you're doing the pray. <laughs> if there's no God, there's no right or wrong. Might makes right. If you can lie, cheat, steal, and kill to further your purpose... More power to you. I had an encounter. Actually, we, I think it was back 2015 at Dr. Park's church. We had a regional conference. And I preached up in Jacksonville, came down. Now, I was, if I'm in Florida, I've got some leftover days. I'm going over to the Tarpon Springs area where they have all those great Greek restaurants. But anyway, I'm staying at uh, a hotel there at the Newport Ritchie and went out to sit in a jacuzzi. Yes, God has gotten this preach out of hot water many times. And there was a man... And he was from Greenville, Tennessee, with two sons. One son was in the early 20s. The other son was in the late 20s. Came out to the pool area. And I'm sitting. He's, you know, coming drinking his beer. I didn't start out saying, I'm a preacher and you need to know Jesus. Look, we need to the Romans road. But we don't need to come across in a robotic fashion. You are a sinner. You are lost. You are dying. You are going to hell. Repent and believe the gospel. You'll run them off in droves. Have a conversation with people. You'll be able to bring it in. Anyway, the older son got in the pool. He was swimming, and I'm sitting there. The guy starts talking to me, and he told me that uh, he was working on another hotel about a mile down the road, and that uh, I said, would you work out of state grounds? And no. He said, this is my friend that bought this hotel down. said he'd been married for four years and uh, got divorced. And really, she, she wasn't meant for me. And he said, oh, by the way, he said, I'm an atheist. I don't know what you believe. He said, I'm an atheist. So why are you an atheist? Well, my father and mother are atheists, and I was raised up in an atheist home. 
and they have an atheist um, outreach there in Greenville, Tennessee. I mean, they, so anyway, then I'm bringing in, I'm not mentioning the Bible verses, and the jacuzzi water's getting hot. Not for me, but for him. And then we got down to the moral argument for God's existence. I said, now, if what you're saying is true, if survival of the fittest, it's not survival of the fittest. You look and see the historical narrative. And by the way, let me say this about the moral argument for God's existence. There would be much more bloodshed and mayhem if everybody was an atheist. Vladimir Lenin led the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution that ousted the czars from Russia. He murdered, he's an atheist, communist, he murdered 10 million people. His successor, Joe Stalin, eradicated another 30 million people. Mao Zedong, that led the communist uprising in China in 1949, in the aftermath, slaughtered 65 million people. Pol Pot liquidated over 2 million people. We found 1.7 million human skeletons in the killing fields of Cambodia. Mao Zedong, Pol Pot were atheists. Adolf Hitler said he would never come to understand the lie of Christianity. He looked forward in his epic, his era, to the eradication of the Christian faith. He said in most of World War II, 60 million people were killed. Because, see, I was asked a question. Actually, I'll, I'll be in Muncie, Indiana here just in a couple of weeks. Pray for uh, the Heltons. And then he had to go. And uh, the minister of the church went to Muncie Mall. And this guy came by and we started talking. I didn't know it. But he taught history at uh, Ball State University. It's located in Muncie, Indiana. Which, and then when he said, well, he's, a, he's from West Virginia. He said, Man, what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm preaching a revival. I'm about religion. Look at all the people who's died in religious wars. Well, I pointed out to him, as far as we know, religious wars, less than three million people have died. And many of those died because of territorial disputes or cultural conflicts, not about religion. Then when I cited all these statistics, he got mad mm, and walked away. And the guy said, wow, man, you must have been telling the truth. I said, I want to. He said, I know he didn't contend history teacher. I said, I taught history before I left teaching in October 1986, before I left teaching high school and junior high school back then. So I told him, I remember telling him, I said, sir, the way I look at it, you have much more to fear from a godless secular society than you do a Christian religious society. Because there's no moral restraint. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nation forget God. Now back to this man. I want to close that and then we'll take questions. Then I said, now, if you're right, here's what we ought to have. Think of this for a moment. I said, now, for the greatest liar of the year 2014, Max, come on down, Max. Max told 28,437 lies, deceived people out of $93,437,000. Come down and get $50,000 check. Give him a hand clap, everybody. That's survival of the fittest. For the greatest mass murder of the decade 2001 to 2010, Rex, Rex, come on down. Rex killed 13,437 people. He eliminated 2,687 babies that were breathing air and taking up space. He eliminated 6,437 elderly people that were no longer a benefit to society. And let me tell you, the atheists believe, and I'm talking about many of them, not saying every atheist, they believe in eugenics, the cleansing of the human gene pool. Margaret Sanger. Found her Planned Parenthood. She said more children from the fit, less from the unfit. And she advocated sterilization of mentally challenged people. And actually minorities. That's why over two-thirds of Planned Parenthood clinics are located in minority areas in urban regions. So then when I said, come on down, Rex. Get your $100,000. She gave him a hand clap. He set up and he said, you can have nothing wrong with that, God. I said, no, you can't. Random processes don't have meaning. That's the only time I raised my voice, by the way. He was getting louder and louder because if you throw a rock at a pack of dogs, which one yelps the loudest? He gets up, throws his third beer, started on it, threw it away, 
Now, his, his 23-year-old son, about there, about so behind me, and I said, I, I've only been fishing one time in my life, but I don't know about net fishing. If you go net fishing, you might be looking for a big fish. You might get two or three little fish in there, by the way. He walked up, then he came back. He said, well, I, I never heard anybody be able to argue. Like I said, I didn't argue with you. I didn't argue with you. I said, you said you're an atheist. I said, I started bringing in biblical principles without mentioning the scripture. And then we, the, it, where it's at, I said, the only time I raised my voice was when you sat up and said, you, you can have right without God. And I said, no, you can't. And then he put his head down. And I saw blood drain from his face. And he made this statement. He said, I'm going to have to rethink some of my positions. He, he was a, I, I was thinking about Daniel 5, 5, fingers of a man's hand appeared, wrote on the wall, many, many tickle you far. And you know what happened? The king's knees began to shake against each other. We need to be able to give a reason why we believe. Listen, there is a God. The Bible is the word of God. Jesus is the son of God. You can rely on what the Bible says. We need to give some time for questions. Now, if you got a question, whoever, raise your hand up. And Reverend Michael Britt will come over with a microphone. Anybody with a question? Anybody with a question of something that you've encountered that you yes. want to also? Now, what about the dinosaurs? What about the, Okay, here, here's a question right up here. You've been engaged in this ministry for some time. How well would you say the average church member in the United States is equipped right now to give an answer to these kind of questions? My brother, I, I don't know the percentage. I, I, I would think it would be a low percentage. We, we have on so many people that, and thank God, they're going to heaven, they believe in the Bible, but they do it because that's the way they've been raised. But we question about their faith, but why they believe the Bible, why they believe in creation, why don't you believe in evolution? There's easy answers to destroy the theory of evolution. So I believe it's important. It's important. Look, we need to believe God for the supernatural, the workings of God. I believe, I believe in that. This church, Pastor Clay Keith and uh, Heritage Fellowship, they believe in the gifts of the Spirit, the move of God, the power of God. And this church is reaching people all around the world. The impact of this church's ministry is awesome. But he also believes... In Christian apologetics, I, I was here I, two times here, 2015 maybe, and then I think the last time I was here, 2017, 2018. And they asked, asked me and Dave Jones from England, uh, not the Dave Jones with what was that group, the Davy Jones, the monkey, not a monkey. But he's good at Christian apologetics, and we sat up here and they had people to ask questions. But I think it would be a low percentage, but we can change that. Actually, I thought, right here of information you can get and what we could do, we could have copies run off and you can get these there's a Christian Bible companion study guide with information in hand music, Ark Encounter um, well the guy out in Texas, he just retired he wrote to Why Won't They Believe, Carl Ball Dr. Carl Ball, I was supposed to meet with him uh, a few years ago and they had flooding in Texas, so we're still trying to arrange that. I got a lot of great books um, from the founder of the fellowship's son. Um, huh? Yes, Dennis and Ginger Lindsay. We went out to eat a few years ago. He wants me to come speak. Then the pan pandemic hit. He gave me, I don't know, about 13 or 14 books on creation evolution. So the, the information is out there, but we, need, we don't have to become an expert at it, but we can have just enough basic information. I'll tell you what, these young people, to get a hold of this, and they know that, hey, that is true. It's going, it's going to strengthen their faith. And when they're able to answer people, there's a question over here. Did you raise your hand, ma'am, over here? No, she, you know, with an evangelist, if a hand moves, we think that's somebody <laughs> want a prayer for salvation. Great question, but I wouldn't know what to put. About. I would say I don't know if there's five percent. So my follow-up question would be: What can we do to move the needle? What can we do, you know, to change that? You said and we can change. You can change things. Apologetics. Yeah. Make a place for it. Have some classes in the church. 
I mean, well, there are videos, there are people out there, great debaters that can. Uh, okay, anybody? Other questions? Get right over here. Uh, well, if you got one back there, go there and it come. If, whoever raised it first. I got a question. Um, as far as healthcare goes, you know, you see a lot of. We're following the science, and you see a lot of this woke agenda creeping into healthcare. And then you, f you see on the TV, you know, the CDC is following the science. We're following the science. Well, what do you, you know, what do you do? I mean, well, really, you, sometimes you, it can be overwhelming. You test it. First Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. When the pandemic hit back in March 2020, a couple of minister friends of mine were about to put on their website, the guy that was saying none of this was going on, it was to fool rural churches and rural areas so they wouldn't have church service, nothing, everything's going on. And I told, I told two brothers, said, brothers, before you do this, take some time. I said, I can't believe that this will be going on and everybody believe in this. I said, before you do that. And both those ministers Checked it out, really. They didn't thank God. They didn't, Adam, put a like on there, put it on their website. So we need to check things out. Just like what you're saying about all these different things they've said about masking, not masking, vaccination. And vaccination, it, it, it helps to some degree. But then they stopped putting out the people that died of the vaccines. And young men that have experienced a myocarditis, infection of the heart. And then also... Uh, Women, even a childbearing age, becoming sterile, causing problems with the bloodstream. Now, it's a small percentage. And the great percentage is that the vaccines will help to some degree. Not that it's not going to help you not catch COVID, but may mitigate the severity of the COVID. But we need to know all the information. So, what we need to do, do investigation before all of a sudden you just jump out ahead of everything. Because a lot of once we stake out a position. And then it's proven we were wrong. We lose credibility. So I would say that we need to check out the information. Simply check out the information. I mean, some good things that in the health care, there's some things that are suspect, and now they're admitting it's was suspect. Okay, there was somebody else. I think they had a what was the scripture reference on uh, the world being hung on nothing? Job chapter 26 and verse 7. You know, science describes the universe in five terms. Time, energy, space, matter, and motion. That's found in the first two verses of the Bible. The beginning time, God created energy, the heaven, space, the earth, matter, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the, the Spirit of God moved. There's your motion. So the five terms that science describes the universe in is found in the first two verses of the Bible. Wow, young folk, I know you guys have some questions. Over here, we got a young man over here. Thank you. <clears throat> so, in the Bible, <clears throat> sorry, in the Bible, God can see the future, correct? God what now? God can see the future, like every decision yes, he can. made. Yes, He knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah forty six ten. Yep. And also, in the Bible, it doesn't say you have free will, choose your path in life, right? Yes. Doesn't that contradict each other, though? Because if God can already see what you're going to do, do you even have a choice, really? Well, God has foreknowledge, but he doesn't make the choice for you. You still have the choice, but he is so awesome that he knows choices that you will make. So isn't everything already planned out, then? Since he no, knows exactly No, we're not robots. Happen. We have a free will. He did not want anybody to perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, but all come to repentance. He did not want Adam and Eve to disobey, but he gave them free will. Free will is not free will if you can't exercise it to do it the way you want to. So though he will know things in the future, he didn't program people to act a certain way. He wanted human beings that would love him and serve because they wanted to, not because they have to. You know, it's one thing if a mom or dad says, hey, Joey, come jump up in my lap and tell me how much you love me. That means a little bit. But if Joey, of his own accord, runs over mom, Jumps up in his lap and says, Mommy, Daddy, I love you. That means a whole lot more. That's what God wants. He wants people that want to be with him and love him. Very good question, young man. 
Go back to your class. Have a good time, young people. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you very much. My wife and I had the privilege of visiting some of the national parks. In just about every park that we went, especially the petrified forest, they had a log sticking out of a petrified log sticking out of a cliff telling us that that took millions of years to form. Having visited the, the Creation Museum yesterday and having a, a ministry come to our church and speak to that, they said their greatest evidence is the rocks and the fossils. So how, how do we combat that in the national parks where these officials are telling us what the facts are? They're hypothesizing what they think the facts are. 85% of the Earth's surface is rock. Sediment rock, which lets us know the Earth was covered by water. There was a great worldwide flood. They don't take into account suddenness. They found woolly mammoths up in Siberia that had undigested food in its stomach. The remains of it. But it was frozen. Suddenness. The Great Deluge. In Logan, West Virginia, Rick Dalton is a minister, but he's a construction worker. He died him out of the hillside out where they put in the um, Fountain Place Mall. And they discovered um, a coral reef. They called the Bob. So they came down. And they said, well, one time this was covered by water. He died him out of further into the hillside, and they found an oyster bed. So they called the zoologists from Marsh University. They came down. And here's what they said. The zoologist said, birds flew in from the Atlantic Ocean and dropped the oysters in this location. Now think of this. It's a long flight from the Atlantic Ocean to Lubbock, West Virginia. Birds get hungry. Do you think that the oysters are going to make the trip? <laughs> there was a worldwide flood. 85% of the Earth's surface is sedimentary rock. That's formed by water. Igneous rocks is formed by volcanic activity. They have found fossil remains of land animals in the depths of the deepest oceans. Fossil remains of land animals are some of the tops of the highest mountains. Where I was born and raised, 84 High Street, Logan, West Virginia. You go up about 100, oh, and 75 feet up to the right, almost behind the, our neighbor's house. There's a rock, and I'm going to say... Uh, maybe from here to here. There's the imprint of a fish. My nephew Billy was an evangelist. He measured that. And I think it was 15 and a half long. I remember asking my 8th grade earth science teacher, my baseball coach Jim Bailey, we found sand up on the hillside. And I said, we found this rock with a fish. And here's what he said. Well, Mike, I guess at one time that hillside was covered by water. I guess it was. But when they, they put here... Millions of years old. How do they know that? Once again, you see in books, they've got, this is the way it starts. Look, this is what we got it. So we should never assume, look, there's corruption in every field. In the ministry, in banking, in the medical profession, and in the scientific community. People have a vested interest in swaying the way people think. We just assume everybody's going to be honest and whatever. But if you have a, a predilection that there is no God, then you want to try to present everything that there is no God. And they would say, well, the Christian's always trying to show things that there is a God. But I think what has been presented, not just to today, but things I've looked at, overwhelmingly shows there's intelligent design. For anything to happen, some people think, well, things just popped into existence. Nobody with rationality would even contemplate that. Popped into existence. That would go against the law of causation. More questions? What time is it? Paul, are there any other questions? Oh, I know online. No. Okay. There any online questions? No. Did you have your hand raised? Yes, she, she, <laughs> no, you didn't? 
Is she scratching your face? Okay. <laughs> Say tread lightly, Mike. Okay. Come, come here, Michael. Well, here you. Just contrast young earth and... and okay. Two views. Young earth creationists, old earth creationists. We should be on the same page of working together and not going against each other. The young earth creationists believe that the uh, earth is about 6,000 years old at most. Second Peter 3, 8, Psalm 90 and 4, one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years in one day. Actually, one minister correlated out that one hour in heaven would equate to 41 years and so many months on the earth. Okay. Then you have the old earth creation. Now, the young earth creations uh, believe in Genesis that everything happened all one time and that the universe is no more than 10,000 years old. Then you have the old earth creationists. They believe there was something that happened on the earth before Adam was created. Genesis 1 2 said the earth was, Genesis 1 1, the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Now you go to Isaiah 45 18. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth, he created not in vain. The same Hebrew word vain is translated void in Genesis 1 2, tohu, which means empty. Desolate and waste. Well, James 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. So God did not create it the way Isaiah 45, 18, but Genesis 1, 10 said it became that way. Now, God told Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 26, 27 to replenish the earth. The word means to refill. If I had, if, I said, if, I, if this was empty and I'd say, you refill this, what does that imply? Satan was on the earth as Lucifer before he fell. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19. He was on the earth. Then he rebelled against God and cast back down to the earth. Christ said, Luke 10, 18, I beheld Satan's lightning fall from heaven. So when Satan entered the body of the serpent, he was already a fallen creature. Something had to happen before the days of Adam. So those are the two views. Young earth creationists, old earth creationists, and uh, I believe in old earth creationism. And I know that the Ken Ham believes in the young earth. And uh, I don't have problems with the young earth creation. But something happened, but to me, something happened before the days of Adam and Eve. Because when Satan entered the body of the serpent, Genesis 3, the serpent was more subtle. That word in Hebrew means cunning and crafty. So, back to that. Nan's question. Old Earth could, I guess, explain that we won't be looking for a petrified forest in Old Earth. That would have taken millions of years if we don't know the actual age of the Earth. Well, that, right. But I don't, th I don't know of any Old Earth creationist like myself that's trying to find some time to correlate with what naturalists are saying. I believe in a sudden creation. But something happened before the days of Adam, according to the Bible. And we don't know how long of a period of time that might have been. Could have been eons of ages. Ezekiel 28, 15 says, speaking of Lucifer, he was perfect from the day he was created till iniquity was found in him. And But once again, I'm suspect of how they say it so many million years. Now they're adjusting. They... they dated other fossils of being a certain age and now they're having to readjust their dating of those fossils. Another thing, evolutionists are getting away from Darwinian evolution because they can. And what they're saying is that there was a whole lot of hominids, bipedal hominids, and that they married and intermarried and there were so many gradual changes you couldn't see in the fossil record. That would not explain it. They're reaching for straws. Once again today, why do we have all men and all apes? Why don't we have a part of man, a part of an ape, part of an ape, part of a man? Or any other species? Well, they tried to say that uh, Archopatrix was a reptile becoming a bird. Now they say it's fully bird. They tried to say Lucy uh, was part human Part eight. Now they believe Lucifer is totally eight. The Cro-Magnon man, the Andrethal man, Heidelberg man were modern men. 
Now they found some among the Neanderthals that were humped over. And somebody from the graveyard today is somebody that died of scoliosis. I've seen people, and I'd almost cry when I see these people in a supermarket, and they're like this. The skull capacity of the Neanderthal, Cro Magnon, and Heidelberg men are the same as you and I. They worked with tools, and they were religious, they were human beings. Anybody else? Uh, I had a high school senior ask me the question that spawned your steady state uh, topic earlier, but some of what you said about what happened before Adam, I think this kind of opens up one other question that people have in the, uh, you know, just in the society. And we'll take maybe five minutes to kind of close this out. And the, the topic of aliens is something that you'll run across on History Channel or whatever. And I know the young people are gone, but with E.T. and the things in culture, I think even for our older generations, it still would be something that would all relate to us. In my opinion, things that I've read between the way it gets spun typically, you can see a very clear humanistic or sometimes malevolently a demonic activity in whatever's going on. What's your take on how, quote-unquote, some kind of a discovery would impact our faith? Well, you read Ezekiel about the wheel within the middle of a wheel, and it would go straight up, and the wheels would come up. It would almost remind you of depictions of spacecraft. Now, why would we think that there might not be demonic beings that will visit the earth in spaceships or visit the earth doing experiments on people or what? Here's another thought. A lot of people think life was only made on the earth. I got a scripture for you just to think about. And you can't do it by one scripture anymore. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. There are three heavens, according to Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, without the body I cannot tell, God knows such a one cut up to heaven. Well, the first heaven is 96 miles up. That's the atmospheric heaven. The celestial heaven is uh, where all these stars are located at. The third heaven is the abode of God. So, um, yeah, aliens? Well, I would never think that would improve the Bible at all. Could be angels. Yeah, but they don't have to use spaceships. What if they chose to use a spaceship? Well, we got this. We got this thing built in. There's so many. Com we have people. You know, people have comps. We're going to have a robe on, and we're going to be on a cloud playing a harp forever. We're going to patrol the universe for God. Psalm eight four. What is man that thou mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have no million of the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Go back up to verse 3. When I consider the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. We were created to rule over the work of God's hands. In other words, we're going to patrol the universe for God. There's not going to be one dull, boring moment in heaven. Hallelujah. Is that it? That would be like uh, that wise sage Forrest Gump when he said, and that's all I got to say about that. All right, good. I want to thank um, Brother Mike Manuel for sharing with us this morning because you downloaded, I don't know how much and how many years of information. Can we say thank you for him sharing all of that with us? We want to honor you today. That was a wonderful presentation. And I know... That you will, if you have questions, sometimes it's, you don't want to ask a question in front of everybody. I completely understand that. You'll be around, right, Pastor Mike, just to answer any questions that you may have. And, um, but that was, that was wonderful. We have a very special presentation this morning. And to make that presentation, I'm going to invite uh, Angela Aja to come up at this time and, uh, I've known Angela many, many years. She's a graduate of Christian Life College. Had to get that in there right away. Graduate of Christian Life College. But we've known her in the past, getting to know her even better in these days. She runs Angela Age of Ministries, which is a very successful coaching network, speaking network. She spoke to our women uh, not too long ago. It was fantastic and out of this world. She has a brand new book as well. And when I think of Angela's life and all that God's done, uh, the thing I think of is, is beauty from ashes. God uh, has taken her, and I want to 
I, I want her to share a little bit and make a special presentation, but would you welcome Angela as she comes this morning. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Uh, even from the very beginning, last night was incredible. I can't wait to tell you about things that have opened up since the, when you spoke in Arizona and what God has been doing in me. Um, so to be able to sit under Pastor Steve again was awesome. And um, this morning, the, the dance that was done, uh, my son was, uh, we discovered that my son has autism at 28 years old. And so, you know, the guilt of, of a mother who didn't know, who didn't recognize it, and to find out when he's 28 years old has been a real journey for us. And so he's not walking with the Lord. Um, and so today, as I watched that young man worship, I was envisioning my son doing the same thing. And so thank you for that. And uh, what a blessing. Um, and then such incredible information um, to this morning that we've had. Um, I am an accidental marketplace minister. Uh, I was born into a life of uh, ministry, grew up in the ministry with my parents. I um, went to Christian Life College, and Pastor Daryl, I have to tell this part, uh, I remember volunteering in the youth ministry on Wednesday nights, and Pastor Daryl was in the youth group, and so that's how far we go back. <laughs> But um, I grew up in the ministry, um, pastored for 25 years, and after 25 years, my life got turned upside down. And I went from first lady of the church to selling windows door to door. Um, that's not a fun transition, I can promise you. <laughs> uh, I went from living in a beautiful home to living on the floor of an apartment uh, with four kids uh, with no furniture. Um, I went from uh, even wearing a Rolex with diamonds to standing in the food stamp line. And, um, you know, I just remember crying out to God and just saying, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? Like, I gave you my life to serve you, and why have you forsaken me? And um, I remember God gave me a scripture and he said, he said, I want you to go read Jeremiah 29, 11. And I'm sure each one of you can quote that backwards and forwards. But that made me so angry. And I said, God, I'm sorry, that's not good enough because you give that to everybody. <laughs> and, but I just kept hearing, go read Jeremiah 29, 11. And I opened my Bible and he said, keep reading. And when you keep reading the verse after that, it says, and I will bring you back to the place from which you were carried away captive. And today is a fulfillment of that word that God gave me. And so when I, after I went through all of this, I, I suffered, I swirled in pain, um, I, I, but I went through that healing process. And, uh, and I remember um, God said to me, uh, I want you to Go become a successful businesswoman. And I got to tell you, I wish I would have just said, yes, Lord, whatever you tell me. But I was like, no, not that anything. But, but going out into the world and making a difference, I'm called to be in the church. I don't want to go out into the world. <laughs> and uh, but I so I surrendered. And, you know, I was I had been raised in the church I went to a Christian school. I went to a Christian Bible. I was in the ministry. And so being out in the world was not something that I was comfortable with. But I'll tell you, I found the most exciting times of my life by getting out in the world and becoming a marketplace minister. And, you know, sometimes as a pastor, you're only as good as your last word, right, that you preached. Or you're only as good as your last prophetic, prophetic word that you gave somebody. And sometimes, you know, the saints can look at you like, yeah, what else you got? You know, give me something new. And, but when you get out to the world and you uh, have an opportunity to work with the CEO 
of the largest oil and gas company in the world and his wife and you find out their marriage is falling apart and you get to minister to them and, and, and spend weeks coaching them on their marriage and their marriage uh, three years later is intact. Um, it fuels your faith. Uh, when you get invited um, to work with a woman uh, who is on the board of the Hindu temple and you go spend 12 weeks with her at her home uh, and the butler lets you in the door. <laughs> uh, I, I, I spent 12 weeks with this woman and, uh, and, and I remember she said, um, I, I said, Lord, how do I do this? How do I, I work with someone who's a Hindu? And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, um, ask her about her gods. And I, so I did, and I started asking her, and, and her eyes lit up, and she told me about her favorite gods. But because I allowed her um, to do that, then when I was, I was going to quote scripture to her or tell her about what I believed, she was open to hear me because I was open to hear her. And, and, and her life was so impacted, I got invited to speak at the Hindu temple. And, and some of my, some of my uh, pastor friends were messaging me and like, sister, how's your walk with the Lord? Have you walked with <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> uh, and so uh, being a marketplace minister is absolutely thrilling. And so um, I want to encourage you, if you're a pastor, you are a marketplace minister. I got out into the world and I started going to networking meetings, and I realized that there are no pastors at networking meetings. There are no pastors there. Uh, when you go to a networking meeting, you get to get up, and you get to tell your story, who you are, and uh, you get to give your, you know, your elevator speech. And there are no pastors at these meetings. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're a pastor, go join some business networking meetings. It's a wide open field. Amen. And so today, um, I, the other thing I want to say real quickly is that being in the marketplace, um, I didn't have a community that understood what I was going through, what I was experiencing, because here I am, a, I'm a pastor, but I didn't have a church. I was out in the world. And so I was alone for a very long time, and it wasn't until I found the Fellowship Network and I found my tribe, the Celebrates uh, Marketplace Ministry. And I have to tell you that, that my life changed when I joined the Fellowship Network. And, uh, and I'm bringing uh, lots of people in uh, because there are so many people out there um, that feel alone. And, um, and so I'm so thankful, first of all, uh, to be here. I'm thankful for Marketplace Ministry. Um, and uh, it, it has been, uh, it's been great. I've been getting to know um, Jason. And, and so I'm, I'm thankful to be here today. And, you know, being that we are so close to Louisville, Kentucky, which there are no accidents. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and so um, I have the distinct privilege of um, honoring uh, a man of God who, uh, who has gone before us and a woman of God um, that is here today uh, that headed up the marketplace ministry in the fellowship network. And so uh, I want to invite Car Miss Carlotta up if you would come forward. Um, today we just want to honor you. Um, for being here, we want to honor you for your participation, and um, and and your. We want to honor your husband, and just for all the seeds that you all sowed. Um, I'm here as a result of that today, and I'm out there changing lives because of the lives that you changed. And so uh, I just, um, I'm, I just want to say thank you, because we didn't even know each other. Yeah. And um, so Jason Benedict, who is going to be here, uh, he's going to be up in the board meeting, and he's going to fill you in on some things that are going on uh, in the marketplace ministry. Um, but he said uh, some things of Brother Larry, and he said, 
um, he said, Brother Larry was kind and gracious, quick to affirm, and generous with a giving heart to others. I think he had a Barnabas anointing because he was always bringing others into the circle and pushing others into their assignment and destiny. And that is so incredible because, you know, we all need a nudge from now and then, uh, every now and then. Even if we're in the ministry, we need to be reminded of our destiny. And we need to remember why we're doing what we're doing. And so today, Miss Carlotta, I would like to honor you, the Southwest, the, sorry, the Southeast region of the Fellowship Network, would like to honor Larry Bennett on behalf of the Fellowship Network and his devotion for advancing the kingdom of God in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Praise God. You know, it's amazing as I was just sitting there listening to Angela and, you know, just kind of knowing the story and, and seeing how all of the networking, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Um, uh, there, Angela attended Christian Life and, and um, then Dr. Schmidt, being the president of RCMA, invites her to RCMA and Sharon and I attend RCMA in Charlotte, and uh, we sit at the table with Angela. We begin a conversation and a relationship. The next thing I know, she has I invited her to join the fellowship along with the collaboration, and she's joined the fellowship. And now she's up here presenting a marketplace. I mean, is that not a, just a testimony of, of God? bringing the family together, amen, and uh, so that iron can sharpen iron. It's just praise God. And then uh, Larry and his work and his ministry underneath the leadership of Pastor Ken and, um, and then to uh, Jason for such a time as this. God's placed you, and thank you so much for uh, being willing to serve in this capacity. And so it's just a real privilege to be able to honor Carlotta. I was able to attend Larry's funeral, beautiful, incredible funeral, his, your grandchildren are amazing, Carlotta. I'll tell you that. I love my grandkids, and I know you do. They spoke at his funeral, and tremendous, and uh, just a, a wonderful heritage. Praise God for our heritage in the fellowship, but amen. We thank you for being here, Carlotta, and thank you, Angela, for that presentation. Um, we are going to uh, quickly uh, enter into a time of business, so I'm just going to pray over our time, and uh, then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for what we've been able to enjoy this morning and how our hearts have been stirred with the reality of who you are as our creator, as the author. You, you have the authority because you're the author of all of this. And we thank you for that uh, through Brother Mike. We thank you for this wonderful presentation, the testimonies that we've heard today of your life-changing power. Now lead us and guide us as we carry out your business for the advancing the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Uh, I'll just make a few brief remarks. You'll find in your chair or in a chair uh, next to you, you'll find a, a save the date, a uh, opportunity to get uh, familiarized with our, our conference. And I want to invite you to uh, Chicago. July the 12th through the 14th, which will be a little bit of a different, uh, we'll be going Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this year, rather than Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, July the 12th through the 14th, we'll be at the beautiful uh, uh, Hyatt O'Hare there. And Pastor Darrell, is there any specifics, anything you want to share on the coming to Chicago land? Okay, all right, thank you. 
Thank you. And, uh, but I want to invite you personally to that. Pastor Darrell, come up and share a little more on that. We have some incredible speakers lined up. You have that there in front of you. So please take advantage of that. Our uh, registrations will be opening very soon and reservations with the hotel, they'll be opening up. It's $129 per night plus, uh, plus uh, tax. And um, so uh, look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be an incredible. It's our 60th anniversary. 60 years of fellowship. So there's going to be special people, uh, special guests, um, just a wonderful time of ministry. Our international directors are coming in, Pastor Kent, and uh, so we'll be having all of the family together from all over the world so to celebrate our 60th anniversary there in Chicago. So I invite you to be a part of that. All right? Uh, item number two, our uh, secretary's report. I'll recognize the... Secretary of the North Central Region. Okay, all right. I'll recognize the Secretary. This is the first time we've ever had a, a dual regional business meeting. So I'll recognize the Secretary of the, uh, the, the Southeast Region. the mic <laughs> your, 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 your minutes your secretary's report okay all right we have the secretary's report all right item number three is our treasurer's report we'll continue in that order we'll go with the uh, North Central Treasury. <laughs> That's what's on this agenda that I've been handed. So uh, I'm, I'm going... <laughs> Just a few minutes. <laughs> Could the Southeast Treasurer be, be getting prepared or are you already... So they have it in Dallas office, the printed copies, and your board has already overlooked it. Okay. We'll recognize the Southeast. And let the church say amen. And you guys have approved all of those. Everything's good. Okay. Item number four, we'll recognize, I want to just really say how much I appreciate the regional vice presidents, Pastor Daryl uh, Merrill and also uh, Pastor Michael. And uh, Pastor Daryl, if you'll come and share with us. Thank you, Steve. And we uh, appreciate President Holder uh, doing this one-of-a-kind business meeting with uh, two regions at once. And um, uh, just, I want to say thank you to the Southeast region, but especially uh, to Pastor Mike, uh, Michael, because um, this has been an idea. This is kind of the far edge of both of our regions, this area. And I remember talking to uh, Randy Estelle for years about doing this, and we had thought about it, talked about it, planned on it, and it never happened until you came along. And I want to say thank you very much for, and he did all the heavy lifting. So can we thank Pastor Michael one more time? Just a wonderful conference and, and so good. We um, haven't met in a regional like this in the North Central since 2019. Uh, with COVID, there were a lot of starts and stops. We had things on the calendar that had to be removed from the calendar. One of the years we were blessed to be uh, with the Missions Conference in Eden, Ohio, at Covenant of Peace Ministries, and I just want to give a shout out to Pastor Ken and their missions conference because it is the best of the best. Thank you for allowing us to be there that year with you, and and uh, look always look forward to being there. But thank you for welcoming us to be a part of it that year. We have had lunches. Our most recent lunch was in Indianapolis. Um, it was a wonderful time of gathering, and uh, so we do have lunches and different things like that where we gather together. We also host a luncheon at the Ascension Convention. It's a youth conference that our uh, college hosts, 
and uh, several fellowship churches come to that, and so we always provide lunch for those churches, and we talk about the fellowship with our young people, because we want to get our young people uh, involved, and so it was good to, uh, to have that again just last week. We were able to uh, host that for several churches from the fellowship, and that's always a good thing. Our speaker at the conference was uh, Chris Estrada, who was with us in Phoenix, and uh, I just want to let you know, he wanted to greet you and the fellowship. He felt that was a divine moment when uh, Chris spoke in Phoenix. He just really enjoyed his time with us, and uh, he wanted to give his greetings. We're looking forward to restarting our regionals uh, next year, and we'll have some lunches as well along the way. And so we'll look for uh, different cities and places to gather. If you have a, a church or a city you'd like to see a lunch or you'd like to see us come for a regional, let me know. If your church would like to host that, we'd love to uh, meet with you and be there. And so um, we're looking forward to restarting that later this year and into uh, next year. We're also looking forward to July, so I'll just make the mention now. Um, it is going to be absolutely phenomenal. I'm going to encourage you, if you can, to fly uh, to this conference because there is uh, free transportation from O'Hare to the hotel. So there's free transportation. You'll get on the Hyatt shuttle. They'll bring you right to the hotel and right back. It's absolutely free. If you do drive in, there is a parking fee, and I'm not sure what was negotiated, but um, about $15 a day. But uh, the, um, the, the shuttle is absolutely free. There is so much to do right around the hotel. There's um, a lot of entertainment. There's high-end restaurants, uh, just regular restaurants such as McDonald's, but there's everything in between. There is a, a mall that's literally a stoplight down from the hotel, a high-end mall, a lot of fun, but it's an outlet mall as well. So a lot of great stores, great prices. There's a food court there as well. So there's a lot to do right around the hotel. So if you do fly in and take the shuttle, uh, you'll have plenty to do there. There's a train literally, again, across uh, the expressway that you can get on and go downtown. Ask me where to get off on that train. You don't want to go too far, but I'll let you know if you want to know where to go in Chicago. But there's a lot of great places. Um, we are just thrilled to have such a great lineup. I heard uh, President Steve Holder is going to be speaking this year at the conference. So we're uh, very excited about it. No, always a good word. Leads us so well. Uh, Sean Smith, uh, Alan Christy Toledo are actually from Chicago, Chicago Tabernacle. Uh, Christy Toledo is the daughter of Jim and Carol Cimbala, of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City. If you know the story of, um, of the Symbolas, they often tell a story about how one of their children, one of their daughters, uh, kind of walked away from God and they had to pray her back in and, and just a powerful testimony. That's Christy, and she's going to be giving her testimony at the conference. Al, her husband, uh, is a powerful preacher, uh, one of my favorites, and I'm so glad that they're going to be with us. It is going to be a great time. Um, we, would, we would love to, to see you there. If there's anything I can do to help you get there, you let me know if you have any questions. Uh, also, if you have any friends or, or people in ministry in the North Central region you'd like us to reach out to, let me know. We're here to serve. And so if there's anybody that you know or maybe somebody new to the fellowship, we try to reach out. The office lets us know who joins, and we reach out with an email and a phone call. Um, but uh, if there's anything we can do to serve anyone in our region, uh, we are happy to do that. We're very excited tonight uh, during the message time. I'm going to have uh, Addie. Uh, she's going to share from Mission Possible a little bit of the work that's happening in the Ukraine. And we're going to talk about it more tonight. But I want to thank uh, President Holder, uh, Ken, and the Missions Department, and so many churches that have been so generous. And you're going to hear about what your giving is doing, what the fellowship's giving is doing in the middle of the war-torn uh, country of Ukraine. And uh, so it's an honor to have uh, Addie with us, and, and we're going to meet her tonight. But, um, but again, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll invite uh, Pastor Mike up to share about the Southeast. Thank you very much, brother. And uh, thank you both, President Holder and Pastor Merrill, for belaboring my questions because even though you know there were some things I did prepare for the conference you're both very gracious to be you know accept any phone call any number of phone calls to you know ask any number of questions so 
uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's it's a, a, just a great thing to see us come together like this. We're in the same boat as you all. We have not had an in-person meeting since 2019. Uh, we were in Douglasville, and it's great to have Pastor Evans with us today. And we enjoyed our time there, but you know, outside of going to the national conference, we haven't been able to have any in-person gathering, gatherings, especially with the transitions taking place uh, with the loss of our dear brothers, Pastor Randy Estelle and Pastor Larry Bennett. So uh, our situation is our board meeting. We had things approved this morning for some tentative plans for next year. Uh, so I will not get into that yet, but I will say that we have had very, in my mind, successful community building lunches in our region. Um, you know, people are, are getting out. It takes some time just to, you know, rub shoulders, no matter if it's pandemic or just the fact that we're all set in our kind of little bubbles that, you know, you got to kind of break off those edges to, to do that. But we were out in Nashville. Thank you to those of you that were, that came to Nashville for that luncheon and are here today. Uh, and we also had a very successful lunch in Raleigh uh, with uh, some, some good connections that were made, uh, people meeting each other for the first time and new people in the fellowship. So exciting things. I will piggyback off of what you said, brother. Uh, if you have a region that you say, okay, like Pastor Ken here is like saying, look, this is the first time we've had something this close to my area. The luncheons are a great opportunity to come and have a fellowship event wherever you know, and you can see those community, uh, you know, bridges being built in areas where you wouldn't necessarily bring in uh, a national conference or, or, or what have you. So please feel free to ask me about that. Uh, the luncheons are, are set up in a way that, that we can pretty much serve any area. If I have the ability to come out uh, to that area, we'll, we'll get something scheduled and have a great luncheon and time of connection together with fellowship people that are within, you know, a certain radius there. So uh, God bless each of you for coming out to this uh, event. We're very excited about what the future holds for the Southeast, um, and we're looking to see you know, God transform our region. It's kind of similar to what Brother Mike was talking about here today. We have a lot of Bible believers in our region, but you know, the Spirit of God is not always you know, welcome to move like it would be in other places, and it's one of those things where a lot of the cultural things you see in faith are very prominent where we are. So uh, we thank you for your prayers, for all the you know, things that will go forth, and we're excited to see that there are a lot of positive things happening in the region. So thank you all so very much, and uh, this is kind of the update on our region. Can we give these brethren uh, just a hand of appreciation for their wonderful work and leadership, and it's an honor to serve with you guys, and fantastic job. We're excited about the future, and uh, thank you. Our national board members uh, from uh, both regions will go with the North Central first, and uh, any any remarks from the national board members? Are we good? We're good. All right. How about the southeast? Any? Uh, I'll tell you what. Let's have all of those board members stand up. Let's at least do that and acknowledge our national board members from the two regions. Please stand. Praise God, Brother Wayne Parks. Amen. Who else? We got Brother Matt. Praise God, Brian, Carol, Justin, and Mike. Awesome. We appreciate the National Board and all of its uh, labor and effort and serving the fellowship and uh, appreciate you being here at this meeting especially and look forward to seeing everybody in, in Chicago in just a few, few weeks. Also, uh, we're going to look at item number six, which is election of regional positions. From my understanding, what I've been told by the regional vice presidents, we, we have... Uh,